All right, so uh, let's start. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Mehdi, and I will be hosting the event today. And on behalf of the group, uh, I would like to thank you all and welcome you all who have just joined us. Well, uh, today we are going to uh, have a very interesting topic on qualitative research and open scholarship by Dr. Madeline Ponal from uh, the School of Psychology, University of Leeds. Now, uh, before we start, I should say that we are recording the session. So uh, maybe later you can find the recordings on the website. Uh, so over to Dr. Pono. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank hi, you everyone. for joining us. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm hoping that you can see my screen. And if anything goes wrong, then just let me know. Um, first of all, I should say, so in the spirit of sort of openness, I'm slightly losing my voice. <laughs> so um, if at any point I'll stop, I've got about three drinks here. I'll just stop and take a drink because I'm getting a bit raspy. Um, but hello, yes, so my name is um, Dr. Madeline Powell, and I'm based at the University of Leeds. Um, I feel a little bit like it's it's quite good timing coming after the um, the really interesting panel that was first, because I think I'm gonna, I'm sorry if there's a slight bit of overlap in what we talk about, um, but I'm kind of gonna be perhaps offering a slightly different perspective. So I'll talk a bit about, about that later. Um, but for a little bit of context, so um, my name, you can call me Maddie, my name's Dr. Madeline Powell. I am, um, for some context, I'm an early career academic, so I'm only sort of like a month or two post Viva, so I'm really early career, and I'm a teaching and scholarship focused lecturer in the School of Psychology at Leeds. Um, I would also consider myself to be a feminist researcher, so I um, talk a lot and write about a lot about feminist research, feminist teaching, feminist scholarship, and I'm going to have kind of have a little bit of a nod to this um, towards the end. So if that's something that interests you, then um, let me know. And I've put here that I'm in a complicated relationship <laughs> with open science. Um, so for a bit of context, I think it provides kind of useful background. So I, I kind of did my uh, PhD in experimental social psychology. And the main theory that I was using in my PhD was quickly kind of became like the poster child for the replication crisis. Like it, was, it wasn't replicating. Um, there was huge concerns about publication bias and about p-hacking and about kind of dodgy data. So right from the start of my PhD, I kind of had no choice but to engage with this conversation about open scholarship. And the more that I kind of progressed throughout my journey with open science or open scholarship, the more I was kind of thinking, oh, is this something for me? Is this something that's applicable to all researchers? Why and why not? So that's kind of, I kind of come, um, I come to this conversation with a kind of critical feminist lens. And I'll explain what I mean. Um, and as I've already mentioned, so I should, I should note, I'm not an applied linguist, I'm a social psychologist. So I'm gonna be starting by defining some key terms mainly because I think it's useful, not because I think that you don't know what they mean, but I think it's useful for you to understand um, how I'm defining these terms and particularly what they look like in my field of social psychology. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to tell you a bit about what I mean by qualitative research. Um, again, not because I'm suggesting that you don't know, but just so you get kind of how I'm conceptualising what qualitative research is. I'm then going to be thinking a little bit about what open scholarship, I'm kind of going to use scholarship and science interchangeably, but I know that open scholarship is much more inclusive, about how open scholarship and qualitative research, what they can and cannot offer each other. And then I'm going to be giving four case study examples about open scholarship, tools and practices, and what that looks like for qualitative research. So just as a bit of background, I'm not going to be talking too much about kind of like, this is what I mean by open scholarship, this is what I mean by pre-registration, things like this. But if at any point there's anything that um, you don't know what I'm talking about, then just raise your hand or put it in the chat and say like, oh, hold on, I need to know what this term means to understand what you're talking about and I can clarify. So what do I mean by qualitative research? So for some context as well, I'm a mixed methods researcher. So I did my PhD in... Uh, I use majority experimental methods and then quickly became kind of frustrated by the limits of quantitative experimental work and now I'm kind of like a fully fledged proper quali researcher and I really like the way that Victoria Clark refers to qualitative research as being this messy swamp so what Victoria Clark and uh, Virginia Braun and other people talk quite a lot about is about how there is no one qualitative research, there is no one qualitative approach. It encompasses a really wide range of 
methodologies, epistemologies, and ontologies. So different ways of thinking about knowledge, different ways of thinking about methods, um, and different ways of thinking about kind of worldviews. And I also really like this differentiation between small Q research, which might be things like quite positivist, um, quite descriptive, quite kind of surface level, often using quite large data set type of research, which might lend itself well to a method or an analysis, such as content analysis, all the way through the end of the spectrum of this kind of big Q, meaty, conceptual, philosophical approach to analysing qualitative data. So I think it's important here to note that I'm not viewing qualitative research as being one static thing, but rather it is a range of different approaches that all come from slightly different worldviews and slightly different methods. So I also wanted to just touch briefly on, on how I'm kind of defining open scholarship. So I view open scholarship as being broadly the efforts to improve transparency, robustness and rigour of um, research. And this can be promoted, as we've talked about before, and I'm, I'm sure that you've talked about at length yesterday, through new initiatives, new tools, new practices. So things like reporting standards, different tools like pre-registration, registered reports, focus on collaboration, focus on team science. But one of the things that I kind of really invite us today to really think about and really critically think about is we talk quite a lot in open scholarship spaces around the need for things to be robust and to be good. But what I kind of invite you to think about is who is defining what this thing called robust science or robust scholarship looks like. So who's kind of values, who is sort of setting the agenda, who defines what robust looks like. And what I'm going to hopefully argue, and I, and I welcome a discussion about this that we can talk about to the end, that is there a case that there is this kind of inappropriate transfer of quantitative standards of robustness to qualitative research. So do the same standards that this is what, if you're doing an experiment or quantitative study, this is what it means to be robust. Does that always necessarily translate when you are working with messy textual data? And I really like this quote. I think this is the most beautiful quote in the past kind of like however many years of open science conversations. So Bennett argues in a special issue of Psychology of Women Quarterly about open science and feminist psychology. She asks this question, what does open science, open scholarship mean for research methodologies that have historically been a home for transgressive and radical question asking? And I think that this is the question that I really want you to kind of keep in your mind as, um, as I give this talk and then we can discuss it in the Q&A as well. So what does all this stuff around open data and data sharing and transparency, what do these things mean for research methods that are radical, that are critical, that are transgressive? for example, some qualitative approaches. Now, when I started thinking about open science and qualitative research, just as when I started thinking about open science and feminist psychology or feminist approaches to scholarship, that in theory, these two things are fairly well combined, like these, the, the kind of open scholarship conversation and the critical methods qualitative conversation, in theory, on paper, have a lot to offer one another. So what I would argue is that they, they both, these kind of two ongoing conversations both have a concern for reappraising, restructuring, rethinking how we think about knowledge, how we think about power, how we think about science, how we think about kind of whose voice is worth listening to and accessibility and all of this kind of stuff. So I think in theory qualitative methods and the kind of values and norms of open scholarship have a lot to offer one another and feel quite compatible. So for example, I do think that there are open scholarship tools that can be an ally to qualitative scholars. So for example, one of the things that I think is the most, or one of the most promising developments in open scholarship is this shift from authorship, so who is an author, who did this, to contributorship, so who has contributed, which can allow wider space for things like um, co-produced research, participatory research, this kind of thing, when it might not necessarily be academics who have contributed. I really welcome the shift towards kind of centering and acknowledging the role of researcher, which is just a qualitative hallmark. So I think the conversations about positionality, I think is also really important. Um, and also just generally, I think that the open scholarship shift towards thinking about things more transparently can also be an ally to qualitative researchers because it allows us to demonstrate and document the processes that are involved in qualitative research at a really kind of transparent and rigorous level, which I think I really welcome. 
And also just more broadly, I also think that open scholarship can be an ally to qualitative scholars because it is reopening this conversation about robustness, right? So even us being sat here today, having this conversation has been born out of an open scholarship movement. And I think that that is also really well aligned with how qualitative researchers think about things. So what does robustness mean? What does transparency mean? Who's interested in serving? However, <laughs> however, I also think, um, or one of the things that I've been writing a lot about, and um, there's all kinds of references that I can give you of other people who are having this conversation, that while the kind of on paper, while the goals and the values of qualitative research and open scholarship may be aligned, so there may be that conception that they are um, both kind of mutually relevant, there are some practical, as the previous panel talked about, and some epistemological, so kind of more philosophical ways of how we view science and knowledge, incompatibilities that I think need to be addressed. So one um, kind of early kind of surface level barrier or kind of uh, incompatibility that I think it was useful to think about is this idea that actually a lot of qualitative researchers, when you speak to them, don't feel like this space is a space for them. And I think that's particularly true in psychology. So for example, I'm gonna share a quote with you now that is from a um, study that's currently in preparation that I did with some um, early career colleagues, where we asked psychology PhD researchers, basically tell us about how you feel about open scholarship. And I think that this, and um, this is one of the quotes and I won't read the whole thing, but this was coming through a lot in our um, in our data. And we just said, we didn't ask anything particularly leading. We just said, what do you think about open scholarship? How do you feel about it? Um, and this one participant was saying, it's for genius researchers doing perfect experimental studies. I'm not so clear on how it applies to the source of research that I'm doing because they were a qualitative researcher. So I think that even off the bat, and I'm gonna talk a bit more around kind of the more nuanced epistemological practical reasons, but I think straight off the bat, there is this kind of, perception that a lot of the open scholarship discourse just isn't kind of particularly welcoming or inclusive of qualitative researchers. Um, so one of the things that I'm really interested in is really kind of digging down into, well, why is that? What's driving it? Because in theory, these two things should be really well aligned. So what I'm going to talk about now, this box is supposed to be there, so it's going to come up, come up, is four case study examples. So I'm going to go through four kind of key pillars of open scholarship and just kind of invite you to think a little bit around why um about what this what these four different things might mean for open uh, for qualitative research what are some of the practical issues so by practical issues i mean the actual doing it the actual being a researcher doing it what is going to kind of inhibit or support that from happening and i'm also going to invite you to think about some more epistemological um issues i feel like I'm, i bang on about epistemology all the time because i do think it is the kind of missing piece of a lot of these conversations about tools and practices so basically what i mean by that is how trying to acknowledge that actually different researchers think about the world slightly differently their research is aiming to do different things um so i'm going to talk about open data pre-registration reporting standards and replication Okay, so let's start with open data. So as just to provide a definition, I think that by now we know this, but just in case anyone's new. Um, so by open data, I mean uh, research data that is shared openly. And uh, what I think is important to flag here is that the vast majority of the kind of reasons why open data is useful is because it can be really useful for to verify reproducibility. So can you reproduce somebody's findings? Um, it can reduce waste so people can do secondary analysis of that uh, data and it can also or kind of typically has been thought about as a really useful tool to reassess some of the claims of um, published research. So a researcher does their study, provides the open data and then you can kind of check to see whether they're um, that it's reproducible. So as the previous panel talked really nicely about, there are some practical issues here such as ethics and anonymity of qualitative open data, kind of how can you really anonymize qualitative data, particularly if it's that kind of big Q, um, which is particularly tricky for sensitive data. However, one of the things that I think has been kind of lagging behind this conversation is a much wider issue of kind of what is the what is the point <laughs> of 
sharing qualitative data and i don't mean that in a kind of flippant way i mean genuinely let's think about this because if the if kind of one of the main reasons for making data open is so we can verify claims um, and so we can kind of work towards reproducibility then if we know that who the researchers are guides and kind of informs the analysis of qualitative data then is reproducibility possible or compatible with a lot of qualitative researchers and what i would argue and what we we can have a chat about at the end because I, I really enjoyed chatting about this stuff is that um it might not be so if the if the main goal of sharing data is so other people can verify your claims reassess your claims then what i would argue is if you have something like a interview transcripts then reproducibility isn't really a kind of um standard of rigor for a lot of qualitative approaches so that isn't to say that open data isn't important and doesn't have a place to a kind of place but i think it's important to have a really kind of thorough and critical conversation about like what is what is open data doing for qualitative research what is the what is the questionable research practice that it is aiming to alleviate okay so uh, another um kind of tool that I think is useful to consider in the context of qualitative data, and this is something that I've been <laughs> thinking about a lot, is this, um, is the tool of pre-registration. So I talk quite a lot about pre-registration and I've written a lot about like, pre-registration is a wonderful thing, everyone should pre-register, students should, should pre-register. Um, and I think it's particularly useful for um, quantitative experimental studies. So just to provide a kind of, in my own words, my definition of pre-registration, then I would view it as a time stamped, I think that's important, um, data analysis plan or study plan that's written ahead of when you either access or collect your data. And what I also think is really important, so again, trying to, trying to reconnect the tool with the actual questionable research practice that it is aiming to alleviate, then pre-registration can be really, really useful to reduce p-hacking, so reduce hacking away at your quantitative results, trying to find something publishable. It's also really useful, and particularly useful actually, to reduce hypothesizing after results are known, so harking. So in other words, running a study where you're interested in the relationship between A and B, finding that there isn't one, digging around your data and seeing that there's a relationship between B and C and claiming that that was your hypothesis all along. Um, fishing around in your data to try and find something significant for quant data and also just generally to promote transparency. Now, I think that practically there has been some really, really positive moves towards making qualitative research more compatible with pre-registration. So there's been some really lovely um, pre-registration templates, which are more kind of geared towards qualitative approaches um, and ask questions that are more appropriate for qualitative approaches. However, the thing that I also think is, is slightly absent from the conversation so far, which again, let's discuss, is the epistemological issue. So if we think that a lot of the um, kind of questionable research practices that pre-registration aims to alleviate. So the kind of, because I think a lot of open scholarship tools and practices have come from, this is an issue, what can we do about it? Um, so for example, p-hacking, harking, phishing, if, the, if those questionable research practices are just not compatible or not issues or concerns with a lot of qualitative paradigms, then what is pre-registration again a bit like open data what is it actually doing like what is it serving um and again this isn't to say that i don't think that pre-registration has a place so for example i think pre-registration can be really useful at allowing researchers to document their processes so a lot of people always ask me when i talk about this kind of stuff they're like oh well pre-registration doesn't work because you can't update it because it's static and it's fixed um which actually isn't true. So you can do a pre-registration and continuously update it as your thinking kind of develops. So I think pre-registration forms can be super useful for qualitative researchers in order to document that process of, oh, I, th I thought I was gonna do this analysis, then I saw the data, then actually this makes more sense. So it provides quite a nice kind of, almost like note keeping system. However, I think that the kind of um, idea of pre-registration as a mechanism to reduce questionable research practices, 
um, my view, and this is quite a hard line view, so we can discuss it at the end, because I am genuinely fascinated in people's responses to this, um, is that actually a lot of the questionable research practices that pre-registration aims to deal with just aren't questionable practices that are even kind of necessarily possible with a lot of particularly big Q qualitative research. Um, so there was someone on Twitter talking recently around, oh, like a, I'm applying for a big grant and the funder is asking me to pre-register because that's like gold standard, but I'm doing kind of really messy, really complex qualitative research. So this just doesn't really work for me. So one of the things that I am really interested in having a conversation about is kind of slowing down on mandates and thinking about what is what are these tools actually trying to do and are they always compatible and what does it mean for researchers who um, aren't compatible okay now i want to talk a little bit about um reporting guidelines sorry something came up reporting guidelines um so this is something that victoria clark who um is an absolute legend in qualitative research particularly in psychology and you should follow her on twitter because she does these amazing threads about qualitative research and standards and rigor and it's fascinating anyway this is something that she's been talking about quite a lot so what i mean by reporting guidelines is it's these kind of standardized guidelines for like this is what rigor looks like this is what robustness looks like and they can be used as kind of grant reviewing guidelines they might be used by peer reviewers to kind of as a sort of checklist of um is this rigorous has it been pre-registered does the data look like this is there a rationale for analysis this kind of thing um and i think that this is one of the things that is often sort of the kind of unsung hero of a lot of open scholarship conversations because actually for a lot of research paradigms these kind of guidelines for this is how you should be reporting um which is the kind of thing where like meta analyses and systematic reviews have been doing this stuff forever and now we're kind of catching up um can be really really useful for promoting um rigor standardization and robustness however practically um, there's been, so I've cited these two papers here that are really good that I talk about the real difficulty in establishing a consensus of what rigour and robustness looks like, even within very specific types of qualitative research. Um, so they kind of argue, so like Stephen Riker wrote a really good paper in 2010, where he was kind of arguing that it's really difficult to have standardized reporting guidelines that are used kind of prescriptively for qualitative research because actually a lot of um qualitative researchers have very different views um about what constitutes robust and rigor and transparency and for sometimes it's it's kind of compatible sometimes it's not i think also kind of epistemologically you should do a drinking game where you like take a drink every time i say that because i've always bang on about it um I also think that there's a danger here that these kind of reporting guidelines kind of perpetuate this idea that there is quite an arbitrary notion of robustness. So in other words, for example, um, for thematic analysis, there was a really nice um, or there's a really nice thing on uh, Brown and Clark's website where they talk about, oh, here's a kind of not a checklist, but here are some things to think about when you are reviewing research which uses thematic analysis. Um, and that's really lovely. And that's kind of talking about robustness and theoretically relevant robustness. But then they also talk about, and they also kind of published after this, when those those kind of uh, guidelines become a checklist or become, if you don't do this, it's not robust. If you don't do this, it is robust. Um, then that can actually reinforce some often quite arbitrary notions of what robust research looks like and what rigorous research looks like. Um, so they also talk about the need for these guidelines to be quite flexible, to be quite fluid and to quite kind of challenge this idea that if you don't do X, Y and Z, your research isn't robust and isn't rigorous. Um, and they also talk about the need for these guidelines to be theoretically relevant to the type of research that you are doing. And this also kind of speaks to this idea of not just blindly adopting um, uh, quant standards to qualitative research. OK, so this is my last sort of case study and then I've got a few other bits to think to talk about. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is um, replication. And this is something that I've been I was actually writing this morning about replication and qualitative research because it's I feel some strong, strong feelings about it. So there's been um, quite a lot in the literature 
around how actually qualitative research should be held to the same standards as quantitative research when it comes to replication. So as a reminder, what I mean by replication is you retest a theory or a re research question by running the same study with different data. So it might be that one research has found a relationship between A and B in this sample, and you want to see whether that effect replicates. So there was a, a study published or a paper published recently that was arguing that replication um, or that qualitative researchers should be aiming for replication because it's the rigorous and gold standard. Um, however, what kind of I would really argue is that actually if we think like this it's stuff I've talked about before that who the researcher is largely informs and guides and influences the how qualitative research is collected and how it's analyzed then is replication an appropriate standard for qualitative research um or is it kind of another case of this is what works for quant and we are kind of blindly applying it to qualitative research also, I think it's important to note here that qualitative researchers kind of have their own quite well established um, versions of replication or kind of a, a theoretically relevant um, alternatives to uh, replication. So, for example, triangulation and crystallization, which is basically kind of um, where you get support for an idea by looking at multiple different perspectives um, rather than necessarily using the kind of standard of re replication where you do the same thing again that they are really established norms and practices within qualitative research so what some people have argued is actually we already kind of have um theoretically relevant ways of thinking about replication that doesn't necessarily need to be replication itself because that's an example of using a quant framework and applying it to qual but again, let's talk about that. If you, um, if maybe you think that replication is relevant to qualitative research, we could talk about that. And so they were my four case studies. This is just some of the um, some final bits that I wanted to talk to about, talk to you about that are slightly kind of tangential, but I think that they're um, important and provide a bit more nuance. And one of them is again, this is a quote that I just think is completely wonderful and and really has kind of informed a lot of my thinking about open scholarship. So Albornoz. Um, writes openness is an instrument to mobilize power so openness open scholarship and power are kind of inherently linked so openness can be used to disrupt power structures and it can be used to strengthen them we must interrogate whose interest is openness serving and whose is it neglecting and this is kind of I should my whole talk could basically just be me reading this quote because this is what I really invite you to think about so instead of just kind of blindly saying these are the standards of um, robust research. How can they kind of how can qualitative research be shoehorned into them? I really invite a much wider kind of discussion or thinking about whose interest is a lot of this serving and whose is it neglecting. Now, I've just got a few extra slides because this is some of the um, other stuff that I think is relevant. And I just want to say I'm just going to say like a few brief things about qualitative um, feminist psychological or feminist kind of scholarship approaches to open scholarship um, and also what that means for open scholarship because there's been a lot of writing about this um, and I'm going to point you in the direction of some really really beautiful papers that talk about this really well and then we can have a chat so it, it would feel wrong to be giving a talk about open scholarship and qualitative research and not be framing it um, with kind of my bread and butter which is um feminist qualitative approaches so i just want to talk to you a little bit about this so as a reminder or not as a reminder as a kind of um overview so for some people identifying as a feminist scholar means that their work is um looks at gendered things so looks at for example the experience of women and girls the experience of men and boys and comes from a very explicitly gendered lens um and for other people being a feminist and thinking about these kind of critical questions through a feminist lens um, means a kind of much wider, and this is why I think it's relevant to talk about here, a much wider kind of questioning of the assumptions of how we think about knowledge, the assumptions of how we think about science. And this kind of relates to this point of, we're talking a lot about robust science, but whose robust science do we mean? Who is deciding what robust looks like? Um, and for, for me, I really like um, Alexandra Rutherford's kind of um, conceptualization of feminist psychology or feminist scholarship as a way of questioning the questions. 
And I guess that what I've tried to kind of do through the bulk of this talk is invite a questioning of the questions. Um, so kind of a slowing down and reconsideration of are these tools always relevant and appropriate for everybody and what does it mean if they if they're not so i also think it's useful here so this was a, a this is a really shameless plug sorry this was a paper that i published last year in a special issue of the journal um psychology of women quarterly which i've mentioned before which was all about feminist psychology open scholarship it was called like tensions and possibilities or something and i also just kind of wanted to flag that while I've talked about qualitative research, oh yeah, thank you, I, I, I was keeping on our time, uh, thanks Mehdi, that um, early career researchers and researchers who adopt methodologies, even within qualitative research, that are, that are kind of already separate from the mainstream. So qualitative research, particularly in psychology, is very separate from the mainstream. Feminist critical qualitative research is even more kind of marginalised. Um, then a lot of these kind of barriers to open science are heightened. So we talk about in this paper about when you're a early career researcher, because I'm an early career researcher, and when you are adopting methods and approaches that are historically viewed as being less rigorous, being less important, asking questions that are less interesting, then what do all of these kind of proposed open scholarship conversations and tools um, mean for you and can they be used in a kind of way that's like an ally that I've talked about so kind of um, promoting the interests of researchers or can they also be used as a way of creating more barriers and more hurdles to getting this research to be seen as rigorous. I also just wanted to briefly mention um because i don't i don't know if it's been talked about yet in, in the conference the idea of broken science um, or i should probably say broken scholarship um, and it feels wrong to be giving a talk about kind of the tensions that researchers need to navigate when they're coming from a qualitative point of view and not frame it in a, in a way that gives a nod to broken scholarship. So Kirsty Whitaker and Olivia Guest coined this term and they were basically talking about how a lot of open scholarship conversations, particularly in psychology, but also broader, have kind of inadvertently created a real culture of hostility, unkindness, elitism, and just kind of meanness in the in the name of scholarly criticism um, that is pervading a lot of these open scholarship discourses. So I also just want to kind of flag that if we want open scholarship and qualitative research to be aligned, and if we want to move this conversation forward, we really need to think about this tension between what is good for science or good for scholarship and bad for researchers. Um, and what I mean by this is this is my favourite slide that I talk about all the time is that I also invite a much wider conversation around how researcher vulnerability, particularly when we're doing critical, qualitative, feminist, sensitive research and research transparency, um, that these two things almost go up like this. So with transparency, you get inherently more vulnerability to researchers. And that is something that unless we have a culture that is willing to respond to this in a kind and compassionate and constructive way, um, then people will be left out of this conversation. So do we yet, oh yeah, that's a good question, Maddie. Do we yet have a compassionate, constructive and collaborative culture? Oh, there's a lot of C's there um, that can respond well to this. So I'm gonna wrap up now, um, but some potential ways forward is, so these are the three things, I've fixed science. These are the three things I want us to do. I want us to have more wider, more inclusive ideas about how we think about robustness or even just a slowing down and, and rethinking what, we, what do we actually mean by robust research. I want us to bring epistemology back into the conversation. Let's talk about theory. Let's talk about our actual approach to knowledge because people have different approaches to knowledge. And I want us to avoid this kind of blind translation of, oh, it works for quant. So how can that be applied to qualitative research in a way that um, doesn't think about ideas about robustness and epistemology. Very briefly, um, I and I think Flavio is talking next about thought. Um, I also just want to flag, and you can't really see that, sorry, I'll put some links. These are two papers. Um, I also want to just note that in order for all of this to be done meaningfully and properly, it should be embedded into teaching and learning. Um, and these are two papers that I'll link to in the slides um, 
and this is my nice segue into the next talk that is being done by the framework for open and reproducible research training that aims to think about how all these conversations about open scholarship and critical approaches to open scholarship can be taught to students because I think that that is really the key. Finally, here are a load of resources, here are a couple of papers, a lot of these are fairly, fairly shameless because I wrote them, um, and here are some really lovely um, best practice examples of, um, particularly from a teaching and learning point of view, how these conversations can be embedded into the curriculum. And that's me. Thank you very much. I spoke for longer than I was expecting. I think I got a bit into that, um, but we have got time for questions. And also just to flag that that is my Twitter and I tweet about this stuff constantly. Um, and thank you to the people who have informed my ideas and thank you for having me. Thank you, Dr. Ponell. It was very interesting and very useful. And uh, I think um, I should ask Monk to join us because my Q&A box does not function very well, but oh. Monk has received some questions. Okay. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Okay. So um, yeah, I think Mehdi, you can also sort of take a look at the Q&A box. We have a relatively long question uh, currently open in the Q&A box. Oh yeah. Yeah. So perhaps you can, uh, yeah, take a look. Okay, so pre-registration, qualitative research. Okay, so is this a question about like what, I'm, I'm wondering if this is a question about like what can be pre-registered. So the process of choosing individuals as participants through proposed sampling could be considered as a pre-registration. So yeah, I mean, I guess that um, the pre-registration not only is about an analysis plan, but also about kind of analytical decisions that happens across the research pipeline. So I think that... Um, like I was talking about, I do actually think, I feel a lot about pre-registration. I think that pre-registration could be really useful, actually, for qualitative research to document those kind of processes. Um, so, like, I can't actually see the name of the person that um, asked that question, but, like, they were talking about around um, kind of deciding who are going to be the official respondents, who's going to be the participants, that actually that could be exactly the kind of thing that could be really transparently documented in something that kind of looks a little bit like a pre-registration um yeah i don't know if that answers the question or whether there's a bit of a question that i'm missing but that's what i, I think my my response to that is that yes i think pre-registration goes beyond um an analysis plan and can be also useful for documenting the research pipeline in its full um Any questions yeah, we do have a panelist uh, who is interested in your talk and wanted to contribute because as panelists, we can't really post in the Q&A box. Oh, so, okay. so let's just, uh, uh, so Siocha, are you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, hi, Maddie, really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Uh, I am excited that you want to talk about epistemology. Mm. So uh, I was thinking about something that I brought up in uh, my talk yesterday, which is what, the norms that are informing open scholarship are. And mm -hmm. one of them is this idea of uh, organized skepticism. And we can see that in all these ideas of verifiability, reproducibility, et cetera. As you argued, a lot of that may not be appropriate for uh, qual research. Sorry, I've got a bad connection. Can you still yeah. hear me? Yeah, I could, I could hear, I can hear, I heard that. Oh, yeah. Okay. But I was thinking about other area of communalism and um, uh, sharing uh, sharing research so that others can build on it. Mm. Sorry, maybe I'll just, I'll pop my question in the chat if it doesn't come through. But um, I was wondering what you thought about sharing open data, not for reproducibility, but for reuse. So there's examples like Daybrary and other places that, um, make uh, data available for people that might not be able to access data or to collect data that are difficult to collect. Uh, so there's a kind of issue around um, making, uh, uh, making research more accessible, not just around reproducibility. Yeah, I think I think that's a really, really good point. Um, a really good point. And I think that that's, that's kind of why I was trying not to do too much like open data is not a thing for qual doesn't have a place because i think absolutely it's a bit like with um uh with like final year dissertation students that actually in cases like that even in like pedagogical context having 
open qualitative data to use as like pedagogical tools to practice data analysis um, or to look at things in a slightly different way in a slightly different perspective that I think that open data for in that sense in a way of being able to do secondary analysis um, and understanding or kind of having access to data in a way that isn't doesn't require everyone to continuously being collected new data I think absolutely has a has a place um, for qualitative research. I think the thing that um, the main reason why I chose to focus on the idea of reproducibility is because I think to date the majority of conversations about open data talk about it as as kind of very verifiability what do I mean very that being able to verify and reproduce findings rather than necessarily being a tool for secondary data analysis so I think absolutely I think um that the the use of open data as a way of reduce it's kind of that thing about reducing waste um allowing the kind of labor and particularly like participants labor when they sit through these particularly interviews to be make sure that that labor is put to really good use um that might be beyond just just one paper that analyzes it in one specific way i think that absolutely i, I really welcome that um because one of the things as well that um i think open scholarship could help with is this moving from just endlessly focusing on data collection and we're, we're i feel like particularly as psychologists we are constantly just collecting new data and often i do a study and i think surely this data exists somewhere and i just need to look at it in a slightly different way so i think anything that kind of reduces that um yeah endless collecting of new data and tries to um offer different ways of thinking about data i would really welcome so kind of short answer to that is absolutely um, secondary data analysis can be a really, when done well, when, when the things around anonymity and ethics and consent are all taken into account, can be really, really useful and also can allow um, researchers to get appropriate credit for that data. So there's things like there's the Journal of, I can't remember what it's called, it's like Journal of Open Data or something, where your data set gets its own DOI number um, and is citable so people can actually cite it, which again is another way of qualitative researchers when we're putting all this labor and work into really slow and rigorous data collection um, can also be another way of um, kind of having an appropriate credit for for that work as well so yeah I think secondary data analysis is a is a really promising way of appropriately using qualitative open data and I just wish that the conversation kind of started from that point in the literature rather than it being so concerned with reproducibility. I hope that the person who asked that question heard that, but I know they're having connection issues. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Maddie. I, I think we also have another panelist. Uh, Desi wants to make a comment. So Desi, you can just unmute yourself. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Maddie. Um, Hi. It was, it, yeah, it was very interesting. Again, I, don't, I come from a repository, but I before, like I said at the very end of my presentation, before I um, started working on um, this aspect of scholarship was a qualitative researcher myself in political science, where very similarly to what I'm hearing from you, probably, you know, in linguistics and psychology and all the other social science cognates, um, we are kind of qualitative researchers have for a long time been in a defensive crouch, like constantly having to prove ourselves and show that, oh, no, we're equally good. I've passed, I've moved past that, like personally, and I think engaging with open scholarship has actually allowed me to not feel that way anymore. Mm. So maybe ironically, so I'd like to present that as a different kind of perspective on um, open scholarship and particularly even, like I said, uh, the data sharing component that allows us qualitative researchers to to really showcase the rigor and richness of the kind of work that we do. That's how I choose to look at it, and that's how mm. I choose to use these tools to to, um, you know, really show that to the world. I think that makes it uh, available and kind of more prominent than maybe the traditional ways of just trying to uh, incorporate it into published research. So just kind of a, a plug for framing it a little bit differently. We Qualitative, rich, qualitative work is rich work kind of by definition. Um, mm -hmm. And so the more we can display that richness, I think the better that the better it is for all of us and kind of it, it makes you feel as a qualitative researcher um, that much more accomplished really I think that's that's kind of how I want to put it so just yeah. not not to not to constantly feel that it's a deficit that we're trying to prove we don't have 
No, we don't have it indeed. Let's start there. And here is all the wonderful stuff that we get done. <laughs> I don't know if that resonates with you at all. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, thank you, Desi. I think that's a really, really good point. Um, and it's kind of this thing, I always say that there's such a, a tension or mismatch between what qualitative researchers as a kind of community do and say and kind of act and then what kind of other researchers almost like misappropriate some of those some of that stuff like for example i don't think that this whole thing around like all oh, reproducibility and we're trying to reproduce it is a is a thing that like qualitative researchers need to do anything about but i think the amount of this kind of really really fixed idea around if you can't reproduce findings it is not good research i think i hear so often in so many different spaces um that i really yeah and i think that that's why i kind of welcome a like reframing of kind of almost like happily opting out like oh there's all these tools but that doesn't work for my research so so thank you but no thank you um instead of it being like oh they didn't use these tools and therefore it's not like rigorous enough um because it's a bit like i have like really mixed feelings about things like a lot of these open scholarship tools being used or like being mandated or being used in like promotion and hiring and all of this kind of stuff which i think is is in one sense really great because it means that we're promoting these um tools and it means the people who are doing things like you know sitting on these panels and having these conversations have a way of um demonstrating you know this labor but i also think that it's um it's like kind of how how legitimate do other researchers view it when you say um oh well pre-registration doesn't work for me and it's not that i'm it's not that my research is bad it's just that epistemologically it doesn't make sense and i think that that's the stuff that i think is um that i like encourage more of but i really like your point desi around how like particularly open data can show the labor and show the richness of qualitative research and kind of almost like show the behind the scenes of look at all of this data that i i waded through and i did something with and it was like the uh, previous point around then using that as secondary data analysis and using that to um kind of provide another way of getting credit as qualitative researchers um so yeah i guess a, a lot of this is is really complex and i think that the move towards mandates is also something that i'm really interested to see how that pans out for um for qualitative researchers because i think we can have all these really nuanced rich <laughs> discussions um but then how much of this is is kind of or how much of this nuance is kind of lost in uh practice if that makes sense um but yeah, I really appreciate both those points. I think that they're 100% things that I've been thinking about. And I really like the, I think anything that's trying to show the richness and the labour and the work involved with dealing with messy qualitative data, I am all for. I don't know if that actually answered your question, Desi, but long story short, I thought that was a really lovely point. Yes, thank you, Dr. Pono. And uh, I think we are a little bit overrun by the oh, time sorry. so uh, it was a very very interesting topic thank you so much i wish we had more time and uh thank you everybody for having attended this session uh, let's have a very short break and